To me, he's like watching that. his film. He seems more of a back. Just the dead. presence he's got in that pocket, the way he throws the football. Rust days, man. All the scrutiny that line was under. This Monday night's big. Hey guys, welcome back to the Hawk Zone Rundown. I'm Armac, and that is B Rice coming at you again. We got a uh, cool episode, man. We got Dan Beans from uh, Seahawks Forever podcast coming on the show. He's going to join us to talk Michael Penix and possibly. Not done with the with the quarterback situation in in as far as the drafts concerned, and so we're gonna get into that. Panics had a really good pro day. Uh, you know, all the all the scouts, all the GMs, all the owners, they're down there, they're checking them out. So it's it's gonna be interesting to get Dan's take on that. And we're we're gonna talk about the owners' meetings and uh, just some of the comments that came out from John and and Mike about uh, you know a couple guys possible return of of an ex-player, and then in the second half of the show, we're going to bring you guys another mock draft. I know you guys, uh, we did one a couple of weeks back and kind of dialing it in at the end of the free agency frenzy. This time we got Dan coming on, and we're just, we're a few weeks out from the draft, so this is kind of really going to see what we need and kind of really get closer to what the the possible real thing could be. So, uh, B. Rice, what's happening, man? Not a whole heck of a lot, man. I'm looking forward to the episode. I'm just kind of getting over a cold. So when our listeners hear us, I know I sound like a squeaky mouse, but just getting over uh, a little bit of a cold here. But yeah, no, man, I'm really excited to talk with Dan about the owners meeting, Michael Penix, and you know, what's kind of going to come down the pipe. Yeah, man. Hey, all good with the voice. Guys, before we get too far ahead and get Dan a little quick house, Kimi, though, if you guys like what you've been hearing, uh, head down to the channel, hit the subscribe button. Uh, that helps us a lot. Hit the subscribe, hit the notification button so you don't miss future episodes, and hit that like button. And also, if you guys share share the channel with other people, man, that that, that goes a long way. And everybody that's continued to support it, uh, support us, support the channel, we uh, we really appreciate it. Really appreciate uh, all the love, all the comments, and the feedback. And uh, yeah, man, it just kind of really keeps us pushing forward and bringing you guys the uh the content and all the guests that we're bringing on so yeah man so other than that i'm i'm fired up ready to get into this episode too so on the other side of the break we got dan vians from seahawks forever Welcome back to the show. Uh, back with us a second time around is Dan Vians from Seahawks Forever Podcast. Dan, we appreciate you coming on again and uh, talking Hawks. Hey, I had such a good time the first time. Just uh, glad you guys invited me back. It was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, no, sa- same with us, man. We had, a, we had a blast. So, hey, let's get into it. Uh, obviously, you know, it's been going on for, for a couple of weeks that we brought in Sam Howell and kind of hey now we got our backup drew lock went to new york and sort of you know filled that void pretty quickly uh a lot of some people were scratching their heads about the move and hey you know why sam obviously there was talks to justin fields maybe because we we looked at who had a home and and pittsburgh was a was a team where like well they got rust you know that's that's off the list and then boom there he goes to pittsburgh uh so we were we were out of that we got sam howell um, and then some people were thinking, well, well, that that's it for the draft. Like we're not going to draft a quarterback, yeah. uh, especially at 16, you know, maybe, you know, obviously people know we need help in that interior offensive line. And then we don't pick till way later, I think whatever, 81 or something. So there's a bit of a gap. So you're like, well, you know, the top few quarterbacks are gone. If you're thinking Michael Penix well, that's a day two, day three kind of guy. Then you see the hype. Maybe he's mm-hmm. top 40. Then his pro day comes around. And he had a hell of a pro day. Runs a 40. Runs a quicker time than a lot of people were probably anticipating. Now, all of a sudden, he's he's a first rounder in a lot of people's books. Are the Seahawks now, especially with the Ryan Grubb Association, obviously, do they have is there any thought that now they might look a little harder and maybe go after this guy in, at, at 16 if he's there 
I don't think you can dismiss it out of hand. You know, I, I, there's so many unknowns this off season and we touched on it on our last show because we, we just don't know how John Schneider is going to operate drafting players now for this new coaching staff. And yeah, when, when they acquired Sam Howell, who I'm really high on, I watched your show with uh, Jackson Bevins on the other day, who I'm having on my show this week. Jackson's always great. Um, and, and I listened to his explanation. I'm much higher on Sam Howell than he is. And that, that some people are. Um, and to, so when the deal was made, I did the same thing. Well, that, that takes care of that. Good. We don't have to worry about that storyline, that narrative, all these meetings with JJ McCarthy and all the guys they met with at the combine. It's just, let's take that off the table and let's just go get best player available at a position in need. But, you know, as I, I did a show on it the other day, you can't just dismiss it. You can't ignore the connection with Ryan Grubb and Michael Penix. If Ryan Grubb likes Michael Penix as a pro prospect, just because he had success with them and loved him in, in at UW doesn't necessarily mean he thinks he's going to be a great pro, but he's been shooting up draft boards for the last couple of months. You know, I think the assumption going into the, the off season was that his injury history would knock him down the board a little bit, plus his age and, and a little bit of lack of mobility, but he's, he's checked all the boxes. He's done all the things. Just the fact that he came back a couple of weeks after the national championship game where he got beat to hell and practiced the whole week at the senior bowl, I thought was really impressive. Uh, looked good that week, had the best throwing session of the quarterbacks who chose to throw at the combine and then went out and we'd heard this might happen, goes out at his pro day, runs a four, five 40 and jumps 38 inches in, on his vert. Um, and, and, you know, reportedly the medicals at the combine checked out, but teams all have different standards and, and he'll have to go through those individual physicals and and we'll never hear whether or not he's doing that in Seattle because as a local kid he doesn't he doesn't have to count as one of their top 30 visits right, right. so they can visit with him at any time and Ryan Grubb knows him as well as anybody as well as Scott Huff so that's that was the base of my show the other day is you can't just dismiss it and one of the arguments I made was that if you're trying to identify that the franchise quarterback the next guy right we all agree that no matter how well Geno plays his shelf life isn't that long, right? He's in his mid thirties now. So it's, it's the hardest thing to do in, in sports maybe, but it, certainly in pro footballs to identify a franchise quarterback, to find them. These GMs are wrong more often than they're right. We've seen it over decades. So why not double down if you get the opportunity and basically layer that position and set yourselves up to where, there's a pretty good chance one of those guys is going to establish himself as your 10-year quarterback, right? Especially looking ahead to next year's draft where there's a lot of uncertainty. There's some guys with upside, but there's there's no slam dunk top 10, top 15 guys in that draft. It was just, you know, one of those hypotheticals that I threw out there. Obviously, it's going to have to do with how things go in the draft. Right now, there's a lot of analysts out there that make a lot of money doing this kind of stuff that are saying, we might have all six of them go off the board by 16. It might be a moot point. Um, but if that doesn't happen and one of them falls and guys that we have at the top of our board get sniped, can't just dismiss it. No, yeah, Dan, I totally agree with you on that because I look at it now and when they made the howl move, to me it kind of signaled maybe that John wasn't happy with the mid-range quarterbacks, rounds three to seven kind yeah. of in that area he wasn't happy i'd rather take sam howell he's played 18 games he's the same age like i look at spencer rattler and sam howell and i think sam howell is a better version potentially of spencer rattler yeah. so why not just keep sam i i agree with you in the sense of eventually you have to take that swing at your franchise quarterback but when you take a swing at a guy take a swing at a guy that gives you some upside traits like michael Penix's arm is unreal like mm -hmm. phenomenal arm. Yeah. His ability to layer the ball, throw the ball down the field is like no other in this draft. If you don't get Michael Penix, take a swing on Joe Milton later on with his traits and everything. Yes, he has to got some issues he's got to work out on, but you're better to swing with guys that have traits that if they hit are going to put them in the top 10 quarterbacks in the NFL than trying to justify, oh, I took the swing of the guy like an Andy Dalton or an Alex Smith that is a middle of the pack. Yeah. quarterback in the NFL so no I think if Penix is there and like you said some of these guys get sniped off their board 
I think there may be a better chance now after that pro day and John witnessing it firsthand that Penix could be the guy because we've made so many trades in the last however many years with our first round picks, Percy Harvin, Jimmy Graham, Jamal Adams, and burn that first round pick on a guy that hasn't really panned out. I'd rather take that swing on a quarterback that could set us up for the next 10 years than sit there and go, oh, shucks, we should have, but we didn't. Because I've just... I've heard that too often lately in the Pete Carroll era. Oh, we, we almost got this guy, but yeah, we didn't pull the trigger. Like, and I'll go back to it. D Eskridge over Creed Humphrey. Like <laughs> that one to this day still eats me alive that we could yeah. have had an all pro yeah. center already and had that position settled, but we took a receiver when we didn't really need to take a receiver. Yeah. Landon Dickerson was in that same draft and, and yep. primarily played center. People forget, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a tough one. It's it. This may be, in part because of the coaching change, one of the most interesting Seahawk drafts that we've ever approached. And, and I think part of it is because of the intrigue that the quarterbacks bring to it. Because if you're a Seahawk fan and, and you think there are other bigger needs, then you want all six of those guys to go in the top 15 because it just increases the chances that 16 is going to be a lever and a, and and kind of a, a point of leverage if we do want to move down and accumulate picks, which ultimately, ultimately I think John would like to do. Or if there's that one guy that you think is a program changing game changing guy, which I think there are a couple that do fall into that category, it just increases the chances they're going to get to 16. So, yeah. you know, ultimately I think what you talked about first is what's going to happen. I think, I think I find it hard to believe unless they just don't move and they only have seven picks, you know, at the end of the day, it'd be hard to justify using one of those on a quarterback, especially how weak that second tier and third tier yeah. class is. But if he does move down, pick up extra picks, I do see him taking a shot at a guy like you're talking about, um, you know, someone with some upside, maybe they commit to finally carrying three guys on the 53 because of the position they're in to see if they can develop someone. Um, I just, you know, I really don't like that group. Well, and, and the one other thing I'll point to is if you look at the last time we kind of went through this was 2012. We had T-Jack, yeah. our returning starter. Mm -hmm. We signed Matt Flynn, who was a decent backup in Green Bay that we potentially looked at as a next Matt Hasselback come in and take over the team. And then we took a swing on our rookie. And, yeah. that, and that was the thing. And that was a good quarterback class, that 2012 quarterback class with Luck and Griffin and all those guys. Kind of has a reminiscing feel to this that now that they've got Howell, does John go – hey, you know what, if I move back or maybe I take that swing for once and do something out of character because we know John does take swings at things. He's a bit of a gambler. It just, to me, it, I don't see a way that it's just Geno, Sam Howell on this roster. I think they're going to add somebody else that's going to be an actual competitive piece to that dynamic because it's a new regime. And I don't know if John's got a lot of kicks at the can left to get a quarterback with Jody Allen because I think she, like – when Pete left, he made the comment that the media and people outside of not knowing football influenced some of this decision. I think Jody Allen's going to hear it from the fans if we don't get a franchise quarterback soon, because yes, Gino has been phenomenal. And I agree with everyone that Gino's a great bridge. He is a bridge to the next. He's not the next franchise quarterback next year. If he hits his incentives, he's got a huge contract. And I just don't yeah. see it where Gino's on the roster next year with that massive contract if they're trying to shape and you look at what they've done with one year deals this year, to me, that leads me to believe that they're looking at 2025, 2026 is that's when we're going to start contending. Well, to do that, you do need a guy in the backfield as a quarterback. That's going to be a game changer in some aspect. Oh, I totally agree. And I, and I think with the how move, it's, it's what they're doing is they're kind of setting up that, that transition that, that one, one way or another, I, I'm not a betting guy but I would put everything that I have on Gino not being on the roster in 2025 Be because of the cap hit. You talked okay. about it last year of his deal. Cause one of two things is going to happen. He's either going to go out and just be, you know, Ryan Grubbs version of what he had in Michael Penix. Cause they do have similar skill sets, right? He's going to be able to take those deep shots down the field. He's going to put a massive year together. He's going to throw for 4,500 yards and get all pro votes and make the pro bowl again. And, and then he'll have a trade market next off season because this off season was unique. It's not just six elite quarterback prospects in the draft and seven or eight quarterback needy teams, but it was 
Kirk Cousins was available. Baker Mayfield was available. You know, Justin Fields was available. There, all these, it was almost a historic buyer's market for quarterback this offseason. Next year, not the case. And also, presumably, you know, those teams that are really quarterback desperate are are they're they're filling that shopping cart this year, right? So you look ahead to next year, there won't be as many teams desperate for a quarterback. The draft isn't as strong. So if Chino goes out and balls out, they can get a maybe not a day two pick at his age, but they can they can get draft compensation for him and get that cap hit off their hands. If if not, if he even plays mediocre, if he has an exact season like he had the last two years, really up and down and consistent flashes overall looks good, maybe even makes a Pro Bowl again, then it'll be easy to move on from him, given the cap hit, given his age, last year of his deal, Sam Howell and waiting. So one way or another, uh, this is the last shot we're going to see with Geno Smith. I'm convinced of it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And then, and then like you brought up, how next year's draft is, you know, I, I know guys can come up and kind of emerge. Someone but yeah, yeah some, someone will for sure. But as it's kind of looking right now, it's it's – a weaker quarterback class uh, next season. So with all that adding up, you have like to Bryce's point kind of going into this year, it's sort of getting harder to believe that we'll just roll with, with Gino and Sam. And, you know, it's funny though, because we sort of thought maybe we weren't, you know, kind of flip flopping going back and forth. So I guess, uh, do you, what what do you what do you think then ultimately do you do you think we do no matter if if we just stay with the picks we have we're we're having three QBs coming in to camp. Uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah, and 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 it's not John Rice Plumley. You know, right. I know right. I, I see a lot of fans like <laughs> that, that he's a top thirty visit, and you got to be kidding me. That's the guy we're going to draft. He's barely six foot. You know, he threw for two thousand yards, and he's a scrambler. It's that's probably the type of top 30 where they're trying to identify and recruit undrafted free agents. Cause that's, yeah. that's his profile. I think more likely that, um, well, if to answer your question specifically, if we just stay with seven picks, I don't think they draft a quarterback, you know, they go out, maybe sign multiple mm-hmm. undrafted or take one of these veterans that are, that are still kind of out there on the scrap heap and, and bring a guy in and, and try and get him to make the club. But at that point, then it, because it becomes, almost unnecessary, you know, because you do have Sam Howe in Mm -hmm. play. And I do believe, even though I don't think it's a lock in, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, because Schneider, he's come out and and talked about how much he likes Howe, but he hasn't said, we think he's a franchise quarterback, right? And maybe that's just him being kind to Gino and deferring to the veteran. But I think there's that opportunity. You know, and so this may be all, you know, we may be sitting here a year from now and how showed them everything they wanted to see this year in his opportunities during camp and in the preseason and the limited reps that you get throughout the season where they're just, you know, they become convinced. Um, Well, last thing I'll I'll say on Sam Howell and, and that whole situation is it was an interesting comment when they brought Sam in and they were talking about Drew going to New York. I think it was on John Schneider's show. He said how Drew never truly got to compete that one year. Mm-hmm. because he got COVID. Yeah. And I think that still kind of is something, maybe like a, a thorn in the back of John or something that he was more of a Drew guy. We had all kind of figured that out, that he really liked Drew Locke. And now how much he likes Sam Howell, I think he truly wants to see Gino have to compete to keep his job. Mm. And I don't think they were going to get that from Drew even last year because we all knew Drew wasn't really going to beat out Gino. He just didn't have it. But watching Sam play last year for Washington in a, and again, I look at fans and I say, you got to look at what he was in. He didn't have a great O-line. Eric Bieniemy is not even coaching in the NFL this year because he couldn't even keep a job as an OC without Patrick Mahomes as quarterback. Right. And he asked a guy in essentially his first year starting to throw 620 times. That's not a recipe for success. And you, and this is the other thing, Dan, that I look at with fans in general. They all want that immediate success for a quarterback. Patrick Mahomes, C.J. Stroud, all these guys. But when John Elway and Dan Marino and Peyton Manning and all these guys came in the league originally as rookies, they all threw 20-plus interceptions. They didn't have great starts to their career. So I think we need to kind of gear back our expectations and, oh, if a guy throws 21 picks in his first year starting, that doesn't obviously mean he's a backup and just to be forgotten about. Sam Howell was potentially after his sophomore year going to be a number one overall pick. 
Yeah. He lost all his talent at North Carolina to the NFL and he changed his game to fit what North Carolina needed him to do. And he dropped in the rankings of the draft because of that. Yeah. I like Sam Howe. I think Sam Howe could be the option, but he'd have to show me that in camp this year in the preseason and really push Gino for that number one spot to say, Hey, you know what? Let's get behind this guy. Maybe we don't need a quarterback. And like you said, we might get into it in our mock draft today, but if they recoup some picks, the guy that I'd like to see them take late is Joe Milton. Cause I just like his traits. He's a traitsy guy. He gives you some of what Ryan Grubb likes in that deep ball and he needs to be refined a bit, but at least you're swinging on something that's not something you've had normally. Right. And, and his, his profile would fit what Ryan Grubb likes to do, you know, big, he, strong quarterback. That not a West Coast like, guy. Yeah. He likes to take shots and, and uh, that's Joe Milton for you. Yeah. And that's the big thing with Joe Milton. The other thing I like about him, and this is what people forget is they just think of him at Tennessee. Jim Harbaugh recruited him. Jim Harbaugh knows quarterbacks and he recruited yeah. him to Michigan can't discount Jim Harbaugh and his ability to evaluate quarterbacks. Yes, he transferred because J.J. McCarthy came into play. Right. But Joe Milton did play some games there at Michigan, and he wasn't terrible. Yeah. No, it's it's hard, too, to evaluate that Tennessee offense is just so, you know, to their credit, you know, I think it's Josh Heupel that runs that thing. And, yeah. And uh, he's got guys – he schemes guys wide open. And it was the same thing that made it, you know, hard to kind of evaluate Hendon Hooker. Uh, last year, put up massive video game numbers, you know, and was big and strong, had a great arm, and before he tore his knee up, uh, but it was hard to really peg him as as where he fit in the draft for those same reasons. So, uh, no, I wouldn't mind taking a shot at at a guy like that uh, again. Though I let's get up to ten picks in this draft, and then I'll gladly use one on a quarterback. Hey Dan, last last question for me on on the panics thing. If we accumulate a few more picks if we're at 10 and obviously that means we move down from 16 where where does Penix have to be for you because here's the thing like I know he had the pro day and and just just recently sort of his stock was going up to say in the 40s and I guess you know when guys have their pro day and I guess you know maybe you could speak on this just being at the University of Washington and being up in the Pacific North, Northwest obviously not as much, you know, hype around you all the time. Is that what it took to just really kind of, because I mean, you got film galore on the guy, right? The guy is a pro day, puts up some big numbers like the 40, which I always think is overrated, right? I mean, I, I love, I'm a 40 guy. I love watching the 40, but I mean, you know, it, it can change guys graph, you know, how much money they make like crazy running that 40 yard. Um, So it, the fact that his stock rose so much, was it just, people just not really knowing as much about this kid and just kind of kind of having him in the background compared to some of these other guys. And then all of a sudden they see him live and in person and be like, okay, this guy is a physical specimen. Um, and I know the age was a thing. So, you know, and so some people have him on their top 10 and this and that. So if we accumulate say nine or 10 picks and we fall down late in the first and for some reason he's there, are are they going to lean like is is would it come down to if they want to take a guy at that point and say Penix is still there are they really leaning hard on grub and saying hey is this is this the guy for for this for for the pro style here no you lay out a good scenario i i think for me you know despite the fact that i you know dove really hard in, into the hypothetical taking him at 16 doesn't make sense just because right. of everything we just laid out yeah I think if those two things that you talk about happen, we trade down, we pick up extra picks, we get more into the meat of that uh, of day two, which is where I think the strength of this draft is if you're not in the top 10. And he falls, right? He does the Aaron Rodgers thing. Then I think it makes all the sense in the world. You're getting value, you still get the fifth-year option. You get a guy that could be a franchise quarterback, and you still get to attack this draft and fill some needs later on. You can still address interior offensive line and that defensive front and linebacker. So that's, that's to me, that's a perfect scenario. I think the reason that he is shooting up draft boards and, and probably won't fall to the end of the first half. And the, the reason that I believe the buzz is he's just answered questions. You know, the injury history is significant, like literally four season ending injuries during his time in Indiana, two shoulders, two knees. So I think seeing the athleticism, whereas usually a 40 doesn't matter at all if you're a quarterback, really. Um, 
just seeing him being an easy mover, looking athletic, because they didn't ask him to do that at UW. He didn't have to do it. And so they, they, they just needed to find out, is it because he didn't have to do it or is it because he can't do it? Right. And that's, you know, that's where I think some of these off-season workouts are important because they allow scouts and decision makers to see that, okay, this guy looks like an athlete and now he's gone two full seasons and got, gotten beat up. We saw, we saw him get the shit kicked out of him in the national championship game. Kept, kept getting up, kept getting up. The shoulder's fine. The knees are fine. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's what, because the intangibles are in play here too. I, I saw a report, I think it was from Jordan Schultz the other day that he had a coach text him who said, uh, or no, it was, it was Kalen DeBoer. He said, Kalen DeBoer, I think is attributed this quote to that. He's the single greatest leader he's ever been around in his entire coaching career. And those are the kinds of things that are, you know, that, that teams are starting to find out now because they're just, now they get a chance to interview him, spend time with him, find out about that side of him. Right. I personally think he's going to the Raiders. I think he doesn't get by. The Raiders. That's a good fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With Antonio Pierce there, they need a guy. He fits that Mark Raider. Or, I should say Al Davis mindset, Raider throw the ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Devontae Adams gets a guy. Like yeah, it just, right? it makes way too much sense that they need a QB. They don't get one of the top four. He falls to them in that 10 to 12 range and the Raiders now. And I don't know. I just he just seems more Raiders than Bo yeah. Nix, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. way more. Bo Nix to me. Nix to Denver. Nix exactly. Nix to Denver. To he Raiders. looks like there's two teams I look at Nix and I go, this is where you fit. It's the Denver Broncos or the New Orleans Saints. Yeah. Because he screams Drew Brees in a way to me. Good decision maker, all those kind of things. I just I, I don't think, like you said, we get back to 10 picks, go take a flyer on a guy, you know, Jordan Travis or Joe Milton or one of those guys. It's funny how it's all kind of lining up, right? Like the, the fits just are starting to seem obvious. Like we know Caleb's going one to me, JJ McCarthy to the Vikings somehow, some way just makes the most sense in the world. And then it's just a question of who does Washington like, you know, it, now we're starting to hear whispers that like maybe teams are souring on Drake may a little bit. He, maybe he's a guy that falls a little bit. I don't think he's going to fall that far. Someone's going to move up to get him. Um, it's just funny though, how we, we start to see that kind of line up that little. separation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, moving on to uh, off Penix here. Um, the owners mean John, John came out with some comments and, Obviously, everybody knows that uh, we've we've done an overhaul with the with the safety room and linebacker room, and um, you know, brought signed a couple of linebackers and and uh, Jamal Adams got brought up and uh, interesting interesting comments about you know why you know when they first acquired him and all this kind of stuff. Uh, he's now now he's still out there. Um, is uh, what 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 are your thoughts about? Uh, about what what John's comments were about uh, Jamal there, I think John's being nice, and I mean that's his nature. He doesn't throw guys under the bus. He says nice things about him. It, how many players have they cut over the last few years, including just about that entire defensive line group last year? If you remember that, when they changed that entire position group out, where they always you know say, hey, we you know there's a chance he can come back. Remember when they when Ryan Neal moved on? They cut Ryan Neal. He signed with the Buccaneers and. And John even said, you know, hey, he's it's a one year deal. Maybe he'll he'll be a free agent again next year. I he's a nice guy. Like I've seen it up close and personal. Like he he's just a nice dude. That's his nature, and he doesn't he he wants to honor former players. You know whether things went well or not. I think that's just him being nice. I think it's it it. I just wish someone else would sign him so that it could just stop because he's not he's not a fit physically he's not a yeah. fit scheme wise he can't cover and you're trying to establish a new culture a new identity for your team you're going to bring back one of the one of the biggest you know trade busts they've ever had and a guy who was disgruntled and did some things off the field that were kind of iffy and like wasn't really that it just doesn't make sense he's not a guy that they're going to want in the locker room anymore and so i just i i think there's i mean maybe there's a less than zero chance it could happen um but it's really close to zero in my opinion. Right. Yeah, no, I kind of, I kind of thought the same thing too. The one thing I didn't like about John's comment with the Dan was, well, we kind of wanted to bring him in and use him as a will linebacker. When this trade has been such a overall bust 
to then say, we essentially were looking to use Jamal Adams as an outside linebacker. And you're telling me you traded two first round picks, a starting safety and Bradley McDougal. Like it doesn't make that wound any better. Like, like you want to scar over and you want it to go away. And it's like, you just dumped a whole bunch of like, you know, well, rubbing alcohol back in it and going, okay. So we really screwed this draft or this uh, trade up, but um, no, yeah, I, I don't see Jamal as a fit in what they want to do based on even the two linebackers that they signed. If they were going to bring him back as a linebacker, he doesn't fit. Oh, he's just not the guy. He's going to play. Yeah. yeah I well, exactly. He's better and, than anybody. I don't think he's better than Kayvon Wallace in the slot. Like he's. Well, and exactly. That's another thing I was going to say is um, in that whole Mike McDonald conversation with at the owner's meeting, he made a comment about, I want shut down corners. Mm-hmm. That to me with the Kayvon Wallace signing tells me, I don't think we'll see as much spoon in the slot as people think from last year. I think Spoon's going to be an outside corner, and I think it's going to be Brown and Wolin fighting for that other spot, and Kayvon Wallace is going to be our new nickel. I 100% agree, and I think that they'll probably draft someone that fits that profile too. It's, you know, some people make assumptions, right, uh, based on connections. The first assumption when they hired Mike McDonald was, we're going to sign so many Baltimore yeah. free agents, right? Zero. And then, you know, oh, he's going to look what he did with Kyle Hamilton, the slot, how important that position was to his scheme. He's for sure going to use Witherspoon there because look how well he played kind of going inside and out last year. I I've felt the same as you from the beginning. I'm like, I don't think Witherspoon sees the next Kyle Hamilton. I think he sees him more as Marlon Humphrey. Like he, he wants to lock down that side of the field. And, and there's some uncertainty about the other side of the field. You know, we don't know how, Mike McDonald feels about Rick Woolen because he really hasn't talked about him. Mm. No. Um, and I think the fact that they bring back Mike Jackson, they bring back Artie Burns, you know, maybe that's kind of telling, right? Does Rick Woolen end up being a possible trade on draft day? Yeah. Is he physical enough? And I've brought up that idea myself too. You know, it's after this, it's a good cornerback class, but after the second round, you know, it starts to thin out and maybe that, that type of guy that you want, if you want a long corner, and the third round comes around and the only long corner left on the draft board is Cam Hart out of Notre Dame. Like, I don't, wouldn't you rather have Reek Woolen on a rookie yep. deal going into his third year, you know, with, with how well he played as a rookie. So. And Trey played really well last I think year. That's a potential played. piece. Yeah. I think that's a potential piece, but, but I, I couldn't agree with you more on Witherspoon. I, I think we're going to see him being primarily outside. Well, and it goes back to what Mike said at his opening press conference when people were saying exactly what you said, they're assuming I'm going to be exactly doing what we did in Baltimore. I don't know what team I have. I don't know what players I have. Yeah. We have to find out what we do well. Yeah. It's not going to be a just carry over of what I did from Baltimore. We're going to have to adjust and make things different. Which is music to our ears, right? After like years and years of heat basically saying, we're going to do well what I tell them to do well, essentially. You know, um, yeah, it's refreshing. Can't wait to see it on the field. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And and I I like, I just like his comments about just everything that was happening last year about, you know, getting beat across the middle, getting beat up the middle and all this kind of stuff. And he addressed that, how, you know, make him throw outside. And, and to your point, like if you, if you, if you're going outside and you got to re, and we saw the, the non-physicality, obviously that, that was something Bryce and I've talked about a lot. And we also said, you know, there's some wait and see guys when Mike gets in here and Mike gets in, you know, gets to evaluate everybody like, you know, Draymond Jones, can he have a turnaround because, you know, you got a new system in play and, and, you know, and, and he's a, he's a talented guy recast talent, but you know, is that, is he as physical as, is Mike wants him to be, or can he be that guy? So, you know, that, that'll be interesting to see, but I, but I, yeah, I agree. I'm just excited about just, just the comments he's made and just how he just seems so confident that he's, He's going to dress these things and, and they're going to get done and, and, and he'll have the, the personnel he feels that are going to be in place to do that. You know? Well, and we might find out how he feels about Reek Woolen as early as the first round of this draft. Like right. it's, it's, you know, people, people might call me crazy, but you know, if we stick and pick at 16, they're not taking a corner, but if they move down, it is not outside the realm of possibility that they'll dip into that class because there are some guys that would fit. And, uh, and it's a really, really strong class. And they may, if they drop down to 25, like I keep doing when I do mocks with, with green Bay mm. and they look up at their board, 
and there's a corner at the top of their board, like fans will freak, but it could happen. And so, you know, if that were to happen, then I think the first place we would all go to is, Ooh, that kind of tells us a little bit about how he feels about the other side of that field. Yeah, I know. The, the one thing I really did like too was his comments about how he builds his defense. We're going to build a wall. Yeah. We're going to be strong up the middle, which is again, refreshing from what we've heard from Pete for so long is that has been one of our bigger weak points of our defense is the running game, stopping things up the middle. And also what he said about Dotson and Baker, like I got a feeling these guys are on auditions with their one-year deals, not for other teams, but for multi-year extensions in Seattle, which they're both intelligent. And that's the one thing he labeled is, I want smart linebackers. Yeah. You have to be smart to play in my system. You can't be just see ball, get ball kind of players. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I, I, it, It's funny though, how like, we spend so much time trying to parse comments and connect dots here and everything. And I do it all the time with Schneider stuff. And sometimes I have to rewind and listen to it again. But Typically what happens is I'll hear bits and pieces of it, either through social media or on the radio or other people's reactions to it. And then you go back and, and listen to the entire interview and it's different, right? So many people have taken Mike McDonald's comment that he wants to build a run wall, build a wall up front to mean we need a bunch of 340 pound guys. I don't, I don't think it means that at all. I just think it means, you know, they're going to, they're going to be assignment sound. They're going to, they're going to play their gaps properly. They're going to have good technique. They're just, they're just going to be stout against the run. And you can do that with 300 pound guys. You can do it with 320 pound guys. So, you know, I, th I think people jump to conclusions sometimes when it comes to stuff like that, because there aren't, because there aren't a lot of 340 pound guys out there and there's only one in this draft and we're probably not going to be in a range to be able to take him. So. Yeah, no, um, that that's interesting for sure with with the the, the what he said and the, and the size of the guys. But here here's the thing too: the draft's coming up in a few weeks. So, um, like you said, a lot of those answers are, or a lot of those questions will be answered uh, soon enough. But uh, coming up on the other side, we're gonna get into our own mock with Dan here, and uh, and uh, hopefully we're uh, we're really getting close here. The free agency frenzies come to a come to a slowdown and. Uh, Hopefully we can get something that, that kind of looks kind of similar to what uh, what might be happening in the end of April here. So mock draft on the other side. Okay, guys, welcome back. Uh, we are ready to go here. We're uh, set up. And uh, B. Rice, why don't you kick us off here and uh, get, this, get this draft underway? All right, so we'll skip down to the Seahawks pick here. See how the board goes. So it'll be kind of okay. So we're on the clock. So just to recap, everybody, Drake May went first overall. <laughs> I don't know how realistic that part is. It happens sometimes, but it yeah. kind of looks if you just flip flop those two guys, it looks like they're it's yeah. Jaden Daniels goes three to the Patriots, Marvin Harrison to the Cardinals, which is a nightmare situation for us in Seattle. Chargers get their tight end. Uh, that's one individual verse that I would love to see in Seattle. Yeah. And like you predicted earlier on the show, the Vikings got their guy in JJ McCarthy. Yeah, and look at the Raiders and the Raiders took Michael Penix. Yeah. Like we kind of yep. figured. So yep. there's that jump up the board we were talking about. So, so we're going to take Bo Nix then, right? I mean, that's oh, yeah, <laughs> right. That's our, our obvious next thing. We got to take the other guy to make it a perfect six. Right. So let's see if we got any trade partners here. All right, choose a partner. Here we go. So you say you usually do Green Bay, Dan. That's who you usually trade back with? I do. Let me just look at the board here real quick because I the only thing, if this exact scenario were to were to work out, I wonder, uh, maybe not. That's a long way to come up mm. Yeah. for one of the teams. I, I was just thinking about like Denver. They're not going to trade with us again. Uh, you know, someone coming up to get Knicks at 16, you know, but I, it doesn't really make sense. Someone would have to come all the way up from the second round. And I don't think anyone's going to get, yeah, there's no one I see in Knicks. this area that's going to come up. Yeah. From Knicks. So I've done Let me ask you guys this. Let me ask you, you guys, this, are there any guys left that, that you feel strongly enough about that you would stick and pick for? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't see anybody currently that I would stick and pick with. Um, 
Yeah, I don't. Ryan, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I agree. I think there's no real stick and picks, and and I think it'd be a good opportunity to start start accumulating here. Yeah, I kind of think so because I just look at it going, who's after us? If we can get like I've traded in the past with Miami, but I kind of like the Green Bay situation because you said they have two second round picks. So let's see if we can do this here. Let's get uh, they have a get... pretty natural fit where it's it's close enough on the trade chart. So if we get twenty five back and then their second second, it's off by forty points. But I think yeah. usually the team moving up is the one that's going to overpay a little bit. Right, close enough. Okay, let's um, see. Says so it's a reasonable offer. Yeah, and trade accepted. So we move back with Green Bay. Let's see how the rest of this goes. And we'll take a look. All right. So Green Bay went up and took their offensive tackle to fit Bakhtiari. <laughs> that's that's kind of realistic. That is realistic, yeah. right? Move up, get the guy they want. Because currently, I think uh, Fashuanu is rated as the number one O tackle in the draft. Um, Byron Murphy went. Oh, that's that yeah. maybe. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know what's interesting that up until so I had Brandon Kane on my show last week from the Hawks Nest and. He studies the draft hard and he so often over the last two months when I'm doing mock drafts, I love Byron Murphy. I absolutely love him. I like him a lot more than Johnny Newton and, uh, and thought he would be a fit, but, but he kind of clarified my view on this a little bit, changed my mind on it. Literally that he's a, here's a, he's a pure three technique. And I don't know that there's really an opening in the rotation for that guy right now. That's true. Yeah. And, and there just aren't, you know, this is way too early for Devondre sweat. You know, he's a second, third rounder. And so, you know, I don't think D tackle makes sense in the first round. So I've been looking, I don't care. Look, we could talk about some of the corners here, except the one guy that I was going to mention when we were talking earlier about a guy that can play slot, he's interchangeable, all the things McDonald looks for, he can play outside, is I think Cooper DeGene's going to be really high on their board. Mm. He, he went to the Eagles here at 22. Yeah. So I don't care what John said. I think people have misinterpreted or overblown his comments about guards being overpaid and, uh, and overdrafted, but I'm looking offensive line here, aren't you guys? But yeah, so I would go offensive line and agree. Do we try and see if we can move back a little bit though? And maybe how far? So we had. Let's look at their big board in the, in real life. I wouldn't, right? Right. Because I'm I'm team. Troy Falotano hasn't been yeah. taken. Is he? I think Troy did go. Did he? Oh, maybe not. I thought I saw his name come off the board. For Sean. Oh, oh no, he didn't. Fuaga did. Yeah. I mean, that's my dude. I, I, yeah. I know yeah, that they, we're in the same kind of, I know that, that he, he's is he listed as a tackle. He's still listed as a tackle. Cause he, he went out and measured four is. and a half inch arms. And that answers some of those questions, but look, he's, he's still in, they call him six, four there. He's six, three. I put the film on again yesterday. I was like, well, let me just see it again. He just looks like a guard and he's, he he's dude. He's an all pro. Like I, I think he's a long-term all pro who would probably end up signing the biggest second contract ever in Seahawks history. Uh, he fits a need. He plays the left side. I feel uh, like this is their second chance at Hutchinson. I do too. I think he's a monster. I think he sets the tone too on that line. He's nasty. He, and, he like just punish guys. He can get out and pull. He's athletic as hell. He, he tested like a tight end at the combine. Well, and that was the one thing me and Ryan talked about on our previous show when we were talking with Jackson, um, is that if you bring him in and you put him in at left guard to play with Cross this year as a rookie, and Abe Lucas doesn't pan out, he can slide to play your right tackle, and then you have to, yes, get a guard again. But there's at least some flexibility there for you as an organization. You're not pigeonholed where, okay, this guy's only a tackle. Troy can at yep. least do both and probably do both extremely well. I'm in agreement. I think we take him here. I don't think we get another shot at him if we try and trade back. I just don't see it. Um, based on who's after us, some I'll of these teams step are further. If you want to look two years down the line, like because some guys are left side players and some guys are right side. Yeah. He's strictly always played on the left side. What if Charles Cross doesn't take a step? What if he doesn't develop? Yeah. And 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 about- a year from now, they're declining his fifth year option. You know, or maybe find a trade partner for him. You can kick him out to tackle. Agreed. Okay, so we're going to make our pick here then. There we go. All right, so now we're going to skip ahead. Very interesting. 
So we got a little bit of so the receivers started to go that cornerback run. Yep. There's a QB. Team. Yeah, here we go. And you know what's kind of interesting out of all of this? There's one guy that still hasn't come off the board just quite yet. There he is. Bonix went Bo to Nicks. Atlanta. Right. God, that kind of that seems mm. kind of fits mm. like you kind need of a realistic. Yeah, like it gives you a solution if Cousins doesn't pan out there. You've got your guy there, Sweat, who I do like in, is a Seattle player. Yeah. There's one of the linebackers I do like, Edrigen Cooper. There's Braden Fisk, who the Seahawks oh, have yeah. one pick before. Oh, we missed. Oh, Peyton Wilson is who I wanted. Peyton yeah. Wilson as well. Yeah, also Peyton Wilson. Yeah, they're like Brandon Fisk and Peyton Wilson, two guys. Yeah, right there. But go to the uh, look at the, the overall board. Okay. Look at the, board. you know, John says best player available, right? Mm. So Zach Fraser's currently from West Virginia list is the best. Now we're Look at all those Michigan dudes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, is See, this? Do you like Colson enough that this is a good spot for him, or do you think you can get value later on? I that? think you can get value later on in this draft. Um, God, if Braylon Trice was actually two seventy four, like they hadn't had it, have him listed there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? He's a little bit more. Yeah, I, I think we got to take Chris Jenkins. I was just going to say he's interesting. Mm. He's so athletic. Uh, they call him the mutant. He can move up and down that line. And in my opinion, based on his size, he does make Jaron Reed's kind of in that same ballpark where yeah. I think he could be the replacement for Jaron Reed. Again, he's only got one year left on his deal. I think Chris Jenkins may be our pick here. I think that's good value for him in the second round. We're, you know, over yeah. halfway through it. Um, he's not there a lot of times that I no. do. Mm. He gets he's gone by the middle of the and second round. This is the reason so. why I think he's there, Dan, is because Braden Fisk went up here at twenty two yeah. in the yeah. second round. So I think we take Chris Jenkins, and that fortifies both kind of. I'm with five. you. I think he's versatile. He can play. He can play five tech. He can play three tech. I think he's, uh, and he's one of those many many guys on that Michigan team. And Jay Harbaugh is going to know this. Mike McDonald is going to know this. Like. He's one of the leaders on that club. He's, yeah. he's known as a dude that fits that John Schneider profile, loves ball. He's all about ball. And uh, he's going to be a good dude in the locker room too. So, all right, we're going to go Chris Jenkins here. All right, so we're up round three, pick 17 is our next pick. Let's skip and see kind of. Shout out to the guys that created this. Uh, this is phenomenal. Yeah. They're the new kid on the block, and I love everything about it. The only thing I wish that was coming our way right now is is uh, it'd be cool, and I'll I'll give them this feedback too. It'd be cool if we got trade offers. Yeah, so that's the one thing I like about Troy Pauline's one or Tony Pauline's one yeah. that he has, where it's it prompts trades to you, sports yeah. speed. That one I really have liked by that function. Otherwise, I like yeah. this one, the look of it. It looks a lot nicer. Okay, so there we go. Third round, Junior Carlson went. Yeah. Um, and there goes Spencer Rattler to Ooh, the Giants okay. and Michael Pratt in the third. Okay. Well, the Jets need to draft a young quarterback at some point. Yeah, they did. And you know, McKinley Jackson's off the board. So Jalen Polk is interesting to me. Yeah. The look at the rest, look at the other receivers. Yeah. All right, let's on, see what's in that receiver receivers. group. So I've taken Nick Millen quite a few times too. He's obviously yeah, he's, got, he's, he's got, another yeah. interesting one. So my reason I like Polk is because I think he's an in-between JSN and DK and what he offers you. Jalen's almost a uh, JSN clone in a lot of ways, I think, in some respects. A little bit closer to Tyler with his speed in and out of his breaks. Yeah. But I think Polk gives you another deep threat like DK, but he also is a quite a good intermediate route runner. Um, like, where is Jalen? Oh gosh, he's, he's gone. Waiting. He's he's gone. Is he gone? McMillan? Yeah. Yeah, he got uh, on, yeah, on the board here. He got picked by the Jags. Second, round, second round, yeah. Oh, did he? He's oh, long, long gone. Oh, long yeah, gone. There, there he is. is. Okay, so do we look at receiver? It's interesting because we know that they've met with Corley, mm -hmm. but way different body type. Yes. Uh, so, you know the other position that I I want to take a look at here is corner see what we got in that room so cam hart like you said and then there's your kind of drop yeah. off mm, too like, long guys Kyrie jackson i don't see him playing corner at the next level i see him as a strong safety type like i don't see him as a cornerback um 
Yeah, there's quite a bit of a drop off at that point. Yeah, there really is. This this might be why, you know, they may get some phone calls on Reek. Yeah. When I think I think that's a very viable thing. These guys are all projects. Yeah, they're all bring in project types. Let's see what the uh, edge class looks like right now. Mm. Gabe Murphy. They've met with Grayson Murphy, his twin brother. Okay. It's interesting they have uh, Ula Fashino listed as an edge. And I know they didn't they meet with McGregor too. Um, it wouldn't shock me if they did. I mean, clearly McDonald knows him. And McGregor at the beginning of the draft process is one of my crushes. Like he, but it's so weird, isn't it? Sometimes how a guy looks a different size on tape. Yeah. In his uniform than he does in real. When you watch Braden McGregor standing up on the edge, it reminded me of when I saw Max Crosby's Eastern Michigan tape for the first time. Like I thought his legs, his arms were down to his ankles. And then he goes to the combine and he measures like 32 inch arms. Uh, but he's a high motor guy. I, my yeah. edge right now that I'm crushing on, it's not just because he came from my alma mater, but I think I was going to say, is it Jackson out? I think the- Brennan Jackson is moving up in this draft and he's going to, I think there's a good chance. I read some stuff from some uh, quotes from scouts the other day that he, he might be moving up into round two, uh, not round two day two. Okay. So there's um, two guards here that I like, Dan, and it's these two right here. Same. So I don't know if we do we try and see if there's a trade to move back or do we take one of them right now? Well, and then if you're just talking about need, uh, like do you want to double up on on guard at this point? Like I'm I'm still I'm still pretty pretty bullish on Anthony Bradford. Mm. Um, yeah, I kind of like your receiver idea better, unless there's a linebacker that we feel like we have to have. But but at this point in the draft, the, the big three linebackers are gone. So I think there's a lot of value and there's some guys they've met with that are later on. I think Cedric Gray is still there. Yeah, that's what uh, I was thinking. Cedric Gray. Jalen Ford, I really like. I think he's a fit. Therese Knight's another one they've met with that I actually like watching his team. Daniel Watson's not the athlete of those guys, but they've met with him or they are meeting with him. He's one of their 30. So I think we can wait on linebackers still. Okay, or do we do the crazy thing of Pete Carroll and take Jake for him? <laughs> I, think he's, uh, I don't know. I don't think he's the no. athletic. I don't think he's – I think Kenny McIntosh and him are very comparable in some aspects yeah. of what they bring. So I think I agree, Dan. I think we go receiver now. Hey, I've been I've been saying on my show for a long time that fans don't think receiver's a need. It's 100% a need because yeah. you have two massive cap hits in that room. Lockett's on the wrong side of 30. It's you have to stack those guys every so, year. And I think it's cool with? for go. the reasons that you talk about because he can play inside or out, and that would allow Grubb to kind of play around with he and JSN. Okay, so we're going Jalen Polk here in the third round. Nice. And there you go. Corley went right after, right after the yeah. So there's a bit of a run there. Trotter is off the board. That's okay. Kind of Blake Quorum to Green Bay, which I'm fine with. We probably should grab our linebacker soon, though, shouldn't we? I think we we kind of – I think Cedric Gray. So we're in this – now we're in the spot where we got two picks within 16 of each other. So Yeah, you can't wait for the sixth to get a – do you want to look yeah. in the back and pick up a couple picks? Let's see here. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, view trade partners. Okay. Let's Who see. do you want to move back with? If you look at – God. Um, Chargers have two picks behind us. See that they have four. Five, yeah, they got one. Four, yeah. Ten. So let's see if we can move with the Chargers. What if, what if we moved back to ten? Would okay, so like take a, this one. So that, and then like, well, it gets us a sixth. Oh, gets us an extra, yeah, an extra sixth round pick. I'd do that. Yeah, I think that's a fair trade. Move back a couple spots. You okay with that, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, what are we picking up then? We're picking up an extra. We're picking up. We're moving back a spot, and we're picking up an extra six-round pick for us. Right, okay, yeah. And the value is almost identical. Yep. So, yep, okay. So the Chargers, and they took Kyrie Jackson. So that's where that corner, like you were talking about, Dan, gets really thin after that drop-off. Uh-huh. DJ James, Kyrie Jackson. All right, so let's skip to our pick. Okay, so there's one guy I was interested in, which is yeah. Zach Zinter. Yeah. He went, you know, but again, no linebackers have come off this board. So now we're even closer in our gap between our two picks. Let's see what our linebacker. So Cedric Gray is the top guy in that room or in that grouping. I think we take him here. 
I think he's the best cover guy that's left from what I've seen. I like Jalen Ford a lot. I think he's more of a Mike. Um, but I kind of, I kind of get the feeling that like you were saying earlier, I think, you know, one of these two linebackers we signed this year is going to probably sign an extension. I think Terrell Dotson might be our long-term Mike for a while. Um, but, but I'm not opposed to double dipping on linebacker too. If one of these guys falls. Yeah. So they keep falling. I like, I like Cedric Gray a lot. He looked great at the senior bowl and, uh, and the other thing I like about Cedric Gray is he's great in cover, but he's also an underrated blitzer is one thing I've noticed with his game. He's very good at coming off and finding those gaps and coming in between the guards. Now that fits with what McDonald was talking about the other day. He said, if you want to play for me, you got to be able yeah. to blitz. Yeah. So I think we go Cedric Gray here. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. So let's go. Oh, Jets. You buggered it up. <laughs> <laughs> this this round though, do we have one more pick or two more in this round? Just we one. have one more okay. pick, and then we, oh, then we have three in the sixth. Yeah, take three a look more. at the. Well, we haven't taken a safety yet. Do you guys think we need to? Or t I was going to say, take a look at the offensive linemen again because there might be some guys in this range that have. So there's McCormick tackle guard flexibility. So if I put both tackle and O line up. McCormick's still the highest rated. He's a you got Foster. Man. Limmer had a great combine. Coleman's, Coleman's got another one that interests me as a inside guy because I don't think he's playing tackle. Right. He's too big. And Layden Robinson's another guy that's interesting to me as a guard. And Keegan's a guy they've met with, obviously, the Michigan tie, and he's played guard and tackle. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I don't mind. God, have any of those guys played center? I don't think so. I'd love to get no. that, that that can play a little bit of both. McCormick's just fun. Um, he's only played on the left side though. And we just took Troy, who we said the same thing about. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Some of those guys like Coleman might still be there in the six if you like him. That's what I'm thinking. Coleman or Robinson from Texas AM might be there in the six. Yeah. You know what's the position that we actually haven't addressed that we should look at is tight end. Oh, yeah. What do we got left? Let's see. So our tight end group. Uh, oh, geez. Jeremiah Bell, Eric All, A.J. Barn. Now, Jared Whit Wiley is someone I'm interested in. Yeah. 6'7", 260. Kind of reminds me of Parkinson a little bit. Bit better of a blocker coming out of college, though. And then there's Devin it's Culp. A, it's an interesting group. I've seen, yeah, there's the two. The two Washington guys are obviously there. Yeah. Um, we know they've met with Jaheim Bell. He's more of a sort of an H back kind of a yeah sort of a toy. But I think we can still get Wiley later on. I don't think we have to go for him right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Look at the safeties. What do we got there? Strong or free? Just both. Yeah, both. All right. So because you know, got to be interchangeable to play for Mike McDonald. That's yeah. true. Now, I do like that, but again, do we take that pick now? Yeah, I don't know. Bo Braid has really fallen. I, I There was buzz. Yeah, there was buzz. Around a, buzz. a month or so ago. I like Malik Mustafa. He's a guy Rob Staten loves. Uh, is Dominic Hampton still on the board? He's been rated criminally low, in my opinion. Okay, maybe he's already gone. I think he has already been gone. Yeah. And we we can't take too many UW. Yeah, players. we can't homer too much here, Dan, even though we're both big Washington college fans in the year Washington State. Uh, oh, Huskies. let's check back in on Edge. All right. Is McGregor or Jackson still there? All right. I think we might. He's still there. Yeah, he's still there. And so is McGregor. I think Jackson's a more well-rounded player. I agree with you on that one for sure. Really athletic. And I was I was looking at him today thinking, I think his frame can handle 10 more pounds. Like you get him into, to 275, 280 even. You know, he sacrificed a little bit of speed. but he's, Do you he's know so who he reminds me of a little bit watching his film? Mm. Max Crosby. Hmm. He's got... Oh. He's got a Crosby motor. like That's what I mean. Like Watching him play is very similar to watching Crosby coming out of college. I think maybe we do take him right here because I don't know. 
I think his profile, his, his personality and his character fits with what they're looking yeah. for. Too. He's a guy that, you know, came back for his sixth year. Cause he thought that team had a chance to win. And, you know, he's married with a kid and uh, just a dude that does everything you want. All right. Let's take Brendan Jackson here. And then we have one Husky, one Coug. Well, yeah. we have two Huskies, I guess. Yeah, we're, we're That's okay fine. there. So That's let's. Fine. Skip to our picks. Now we're going to be all the way. So let's see how this board plays out. Ah, oh, Luke McCaffrey. There we went, but we already took a receiver. There's some yeah, we. I think we got the upgrade in that. I'm, Jordan Travis. There you go. Yeah. So he went to Florida State. So we have three picks in this round, right? Oh, I was Bill hoping. Milton. Oh, I was hoping he went to freaking Arizona. Oh, oh, there goes McGregor. And there's Jaheim Bell, Brandon Coleman. So, so Dan, we, we don't have a quarterback yet to who we picked, and let's, I know we discussed. Yeah, let's see who's uh, left. Uh, who is left at the quarterback. I want to just take a quick look, and obviously Milton was a guy that b race you were probably going to. I was If he was there in one of these picks in the six, I even yeah. this pick right just now. Got, yeah. yeah. Sam Harton, you get the best none hair in the draft. Guys, none of these guys do it for him. There's, no. You know, I think the only guy that there that's in that list that's even draftable is – is I see when I put on the 2023 Devin Leary tape is you see NFL throws. Yeah, that's the only way I can see. Played for me and Cohen, and and I thought he had a better combine than people gave him credit for. And, and, uh, you know, to me, he's a seventh rounder, but. I I think you're right, 290. I think we can wait on him. He's the only guy I would even try drafting right now. Yeah. And with um, with everything we talked about early, like with yeah. this group that's left, like you can just sign Plumley and undraft exactly, you know, whatever. You're not none of these guys are gonna. Okay, so we can go Malik Ooh. and we can go Jared Wiley because we're back to back basically with the Patriots in between us. I'm cool with that. Okay. Okay, so we'll go Malik. Let's get to my next pick. Perfect. They did not. The Patriots didn't screw us over, and then. They get tight. Ooh. I did not see that. That changes things a little bit. Yeah, I think Keegan's a guy in this range they would really value. He can he he can play tack he can play right tackle. Yeah, that's but what I'm wondering. Played, he's played a lot of guard too. And we're back, like we're not that far off. We might be able to still get Wiley later on because we're at 16 in this round, so we're only 10 picks. I think we take Keegan here, or we lose him. I'm cool with that. I I think doubling up on offensive line in some former fashion is is probably something we're going to see him do oh well my tennessee ruined our plans guys <laughs> eric all cedric johnson matt lee you know is a kid from uh arizona Mc, mclaughlin is he still there what position tight end Tight end. mclaughlin is he's not as much of a blocker more of a move guy but uh but we do have pharaoh brown for blocking now so yeah. What he about one, be... one of the Washington guys? Devin Colt. Like there's Husky fans will swear. Well, we can't take three Huskies. I was going to say there's, there's Husky fans that think that Jack Westover is Will Disley. Mm. Essentially. Yeah. Um, I'd rather have a more versatility in that room than like pure blocking. Like I get Farrell Brown's kind of been brought in for that role, but that's what Parkinson had me so excited about. If he hadn't signed his big deal with Rams, which is great for him, but yeah. he was starting to become that multiple use guy. Yeah. So do we take Tanner McLaughlin here? He's a guy that early in the draft, I can't remember who it was, Charles Smith maybe, or Bucky who was saying, this guy looks like an NFL tight end today as far as his receiving profile. Uh, guy can move well, runs good routes, good hands. And that might be kind of more what we need. If we have, you know, Farrell Brown's the blocking guy. Yeah, I think so. I think we got to go with. Let's our, just check before we do that, check all and just see if there's someone we're just missing. No, nope. basically Taylor Hulk. And then that's He's too small, right. I, I don't see anybody that we're really missing here. Yeah. I, I think that's the right move. All right. We're going to go with Tanner here. Okay, now maybe, hopefully, Devin Leary is there at the end of this. <laughs> oh, there goes Tyrese Knight. That's a linebacker I did really like. Yeah, and they've met with him. Any other linebackers slip through the cracks? 
Uh, let's see here. So Sam Hartman went to the Buccaneers. Okay, so let's take a look at our linebackers here. So Michael Barrett from Michigan, who I know is kind of a utility guy. Yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, I just watched some Michael Barrett this morning because Matt Miller tweeted out that Michael Barrett's tape against Alabama this year was the best linebacker tape he watched of anyone all year long. Wow. And that's high praise going against that team. Yeah. So I went back and watched the Alabama game and it's pretty impressive. He's another guy that like, he doesn't look six foot two thirty nine on film. He looks a lot smaller than that. So do we take him? Okay. So I'll say it's between based on how our drafts fallen. I say it's between Michael Barrett and Devin Leary. But I think you get Devin Leary as a UDF yeah. if we had yeah. that ability at in this, this point. Yeah, I, unless you know some teams just thinking he's the next Brock Purdy, right? Take him at the end. Of, I I think taking a, another linebacker and having two guys on rookie contracts, potentially four year contracts, when you have your two starters this year on one year deals, makes a lot. I think of that's sense. the right thing to do. Okay, so that's what we'll do. There you go. He can help teach the scheme. Like I think he he complements Cedric Gray pretty well. So let's even see if Leary goes here. Because if not, that's my first call as a nope. Nope. All right. View the results. That's interesting. You can scroll. Do they get? Oh, no, they do. That's one thing these simulators always do that I wish they didn't is as soon as the draft is done, it kicks you out. Yeah. But I wish you could keep scrolling so you could like kind of visualize what you would do in undrafted. So based off of this, yeah, like we made some good trades. We moved back. We accumulated so got, a pick we got 10 players right yeah we got 10 guys one two three four five yep. six seven eight nine oh nine we didn't get 10 we got nine okay so still but looking at that draft if seattle came out of the draft this year with that i can't be mad at that no i i'd be ecstatic honestly that would to me you you set yourself up for a very solid future yeah you you've added young upside to every single position except running back. And you're going to sign a couple undrafted guys and let them battle it out for that fourth spot. But yeah. I think so, yeah. That's, yeah. Overall, it looks good. I mean, Dan, I think that I, might I, be I, one of the favorite mock drafts of all the hundreds that I've done this off. Season. Wow. Well, that, that yeah, that's, that's high praise. So what do you think of the, the, the no quarterback thing then was, is that, is that, is that maybe a missing piece there for you or, or would you say, you know what? Uh, not this year, we'll, not with we'll this class. About that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I think one other kind of interesting aspect to what we were talking about earlier is let's say we're right. Let's say, you know, three or four guys don't just jump up and have great years next year and establish themselves as top 15 quarterback picks in the draft next year. That could work into Seattle's favor, too, because the thing that's been missing the last couple of years in these drafts and it's missing this year is the ability to get a guy later that can actually play. Right. And so let's say Carson Beck and Quinn Ewers and all these other dudes just go out and have good seasons, but but don't establish themselves as top 10, top 15 picks. Okay. You know, well then, then if we've built our roster to the point that we can take a chance on a guy, get a guy in the second round, which this draft just doesn't have that guy. So I like that draft. It's really balanced. You know, you've yeah. checked a lot of boxes. You doubled up on linebacker and offensive line, which are two biggest needs. You still add a bigger edge. You add another safety to that room where most of those guys are – Signed short term. The only thing we didn't add was a corner, but we just didn't like him enough. And that room is stacked. They literally yeah. brought back the entire cornerback room intact. So, well, yeah. and like you said too, Dan, like with the way that cornerback draft class falls off, Wolin may very well be a guy that they get calls about. Like, hey, we'll give you an extra third. We'll give you something for next year's draft. And the other thing that I, I'll say about this whole free agency offseason I think is very interesting is I wonder if because, and we talked with Rob about this state, and is the QB I liked the most that I thought potentially was coming out this year was Quinn Ewers out of Texas. Mm -hmm. And I thought he fit John Schneider mentality, the way he plays everything. When he didn't declare and they've got these comp picks, I wonder for John – if there is an A in the back of his head, I know Quinn's coming out next year. I'm going to load up to try and move up if we're not there to go and get him next year. 
I've thought the same thing for a while because he he oddly name dropped him. In, yes. I think it was the day two post draft press conference last year. They were talking about how they were looking at some other guy at Texas and I, I can't remember the context, but he just mentioned Quinn, called him by his yeah. first name. And I'm like, that's odd. He's already looking at that dude. And and it, it just felt different than just the fact that he has an encyclopedic memory of all these prospects that he's seen because that's what he does. Um, yeah. And, and then I go back and forth. I just the other day, I went and watched some more Quinn Ewers film, like trying to fall in love with him and I couldn't, but there, there's some, there's some things in his game that need to be improved, but, uh, that might be kind of a John Schneider style because stylistically he, yeah, there's some similarities with Sam Howell too, you know, kind of yep. physically and, and the way they throw the football and, um, it's interesting. Yeah. He might already be eyeing some guys. As long as his name isn't Shadu or Sanders, because I want to stay. Well, I doubt we're going to get a train wreck. Not playing in a cold place. <laughs> yeah, I don't want anything to do with that dude. That, yeah, that sounds like a nightmare that's about to happen. Oh, God. Somebody, it's going to be somebody's nightmare, and I don't think it's going to be the Seahawks. So that's no. uh, that'll be a good thing. But it, it's cool, man. Hey, doing this mock, it's funny because the last mock B Rice and I did, we had Penix uh, at fifty nine. So that just, within a couple of weeks, you know how how things change, and yeah. you know guys have the pro days, and and the hype gets real, and then Penix all of a sudden is, you know. A lot higher than that. Even when we took him at fifty nine in a mock, we were like, "Wow, we got fifty nine because the you know, rumblings of forty to fifty range." And uh, but you know what? Yeah, it's, it's you can't be mad at that. That's that's a good looking draft. So hopefully we can get something similar to that and getting the uh, getting what we need, best player available. I mean, you know, you you get uh, you get some guards, you get some some edge, you get you know, sort of everything. You kind of you kind of even throw this out there. I. And, and some of your viewers might be kind of screaming this at the screen right now. Like in real life, I don't think there's any scenario where Troy Falutano lasts until pick 25. Pick 25 yeah, but if, I know. if all another guy that I really like that, that, that can also play tackle and guard, if you just plug Graham Barton into that exact same spot, mm. I'm, I'm still okay with that, that overall group. And, and I'm yeah. not just as happy, but he's not going to be there at 25. But no. Graham Barton is a guy that I think would fit perfectly there too. So I, I still think it's a great draft if you do that. No, hundred percent. I, I really like that draft. I'm happy with what we got out of it. And like you said, there were a lot of rounds in there where we thought this is where real life kind of guys could go. Bo Nix to a potential Atlanta, yeah. Michael Penix to, and JJ McCarthy, the Vikings and the uh, Raiders there. So I think if Seattle came out with something like One of those this, guys has to fall. Yeah, but it's good. There's, I just don't buy all six of them in the top 15. No, I don't either. It just doesn't happen that way. Oh, so. Right. Absolutely. I will say, I love the interface for walk the mock. I think the one thing, like you said, Dan, and I'll send him the same thing too, is just if it prompted trades to you, and no. that would be the one thing that would put this thing over the top. Cause they're the one I've been waiting for someone to actually incorporate the, the trade value chart values into trades even the pro football network one and the sports key to one um you have to kind of open your own window and match it up that the trades they offer you are, aren't realistic and yeah. so the other one that inc does incorporate the trade charts is uh nfl draft buzz i don't know if you've tried that one no i haven't it's so i was excited about it you you actually get to pick if you want to use the jimmy johnson or the rich hill but then the the trades that the computer offers you don't match the trade chart and the interface is kind of clunky. This is, uh, this is, you know, the new kid on the block, but I think yeah. they, uh, they got a lot of things right before they debuted this thing. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. The other guys should be worried. The, the other, yeah. Should, should be, <laughs> yeah. Should be watching yeah. the back. Watch how quickly they, they write the trade charts into their software. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun doing a mock with you, Dan, and we appreciate you coming back on the show with us again. Yeah, uh, it, it was awesome once again. Um, before we let you go, man, what, uh, where can our viewers and listeners find uh, find your stuff? We know you got the podcast, and and uh, where else can well talk about the pod and and talk about where uh, where all your stuff is. Sure, yeah, it's called Seahawks Forever. It's on all the audio platforms, and then uh, the YouTube channel, of course. Uh, got a bunch of stuff stacked up this week that I'm really excited about. Got Clinton Bonner from the uh, from the Seahawkers uh, podcast. He's always fun to talk to. We're going to talk draft, of course. And then uh, Emery Hunt, who does the football game plan 
uh, scouting draft guide who just came out or comes out, I think officially tomorrow. He's going to join me tomorrow. He does work for CBS sports as well. He, he pounds the turf and, and tours this country and, and does just about as much work as anybody out there looking at even small school prospects. Um, and, uh, and then catching up with Jackson Bevins again later this week as well. So lots of stuff stacked up. The closer we get to the draft, the more we're going to do. And uh, if you like mock drafts, tune in tomorrow. Uh, Michael Thompson at 12th Man Rising is going to join me. And we're going to do, uh, we're going to compare two drafts. He's going to do one with Michael Penix at 16. I'm going to do one without a quarterback. We'll compare those. And then we're going to throw a little bonus live mock draft in there too, uh, just like we did here tonight. And that's going to be live. I don't go live a lot but we're going to do that tomorrow night. So uh, that would be, if you follow me on Twitter at Seahawks forever, you get all the updates. Perfect. Cool, cool stuff. Yeah. So guys go over mm. and check Dan's stuff out. Cause uh, Dan, you put out awesome content and we've been following you. And uh, so anybody, anybody on our end head over there and, uh, and then get on it. So Dan, I appreciate you- it. And anything I can do to get you guys support, you know, I'll pump you up on the show and uh, absolutely. We need to get as many subscribers over to your channel as we can get. Cause you guys are doing some fun stuff. Uh, we appreciate it, man. Perfect. Appreciate Thanks, your man. feedback. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so hopefully uh, we get you back on the near future, maybe some point after the draft before camp, and we can kind of see how this team's shaping up. Yeah, it's going to be here before you know it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Give me no. a shout anytime. Awesome. Appreciate Thanks, it, Dan. Man. All right.